Well, welcome. I'll welcome everybody. My name is Gwenda B. Davey, and I'm the chair of the Melbourne branch of the uh, Friends of the National Film and Sound Archive. Um, it's a great pleasure, and I may say an unusual situation, that we're able to have three of the main people involved in the production of the 2006 film Hunt Angels. Um, Alec Morgan, Sue Maslin, and Daryl Delora. And I thank them very much for their participation today. Before we begin, thank you. thank you. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that wherever we are while we're watching this film, we are on Aboriginal oh, land, land that has never been ceded. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I now want to hand over to Peter Kraus, who will act as our interlocutor for our Q&A session today. Peter is a film critic and broadcaster and uh, a member of the Mel Friends NFSA committee. Thank you, Peter. Thank, thank you, Gwenda. Thank you. And I'm so pleased to be uh, hosting this discussion about a film that deserves to be seen much more broadly, a film that uh, is an, an incredible look at uh, attempts to create uh, an Australian film industry <laughs> um, uh, before the Americans swallowed it all up again. So uh, Hunt Angels is, uh, I think, an, an important film to discuss and welcome everyone to this discussion uh, about this film Hunt Angels. And uh, yes, it's my pleasure to be speaking to Sue Maslin, who's the producer of Hunt Angels, uh, Daryl Delora, who's the co-producer of the film, and Alec Morgan, who is the co-producer, writer, and director of Hunt Angels. Welcome and welcome everyone. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and hopefully everyone's been able to have a look at the film um, because it is such a, a significant film. So where do we begin? Well, we will begin by asking the question, how did you find out about and want to make a film about Rupert Kathner and uh, Alma Brooks? Well, I guess that's me. Um, uh, I discovered, um, first of all, uh, Rupert Kathner, when I was working on a rather uh, dubious production called Our Century, which was a co-production between Film Australia and Channel 9. And, you know, we, so we, we, were, we were in 1998 when I was researching that. And I, I came across a couple of Kathner, films by Kathner, which were quite fascinating. They're actually kind of newsreels made in the 1930s and early 1940s in Australia, in Sydney, um, that Kathner had made almost like the March of Time, which was the American uh, newsreel, which was quite racy. And he was looking at unusual things for newsreels uh, internationally at that time was crime, drug smuggling, you know, horse racing, poverty and social issues. But um, somehow I started to see his feature film um, uh, and his feature films. But the more I read about him, the more um, I got fascinated by his attempts to make films in Australia uh, on virtually no money at a time when, you know, Hollywood was stepping in and taking over not only, the, you know, distribution into Australia, but owned many of the cinemas. So um, then I realized, then I started to learn that he worked with a woman called Alma Brooks, again, of dubious background, um, but both were keenly fascinating, uh, fascinating personalities. Um, who really had a great drive to try and make Australian films. So it sort of, it began there uh, around about that time. Yeah. Okay, how interesting. And and obviously there were a number of films existing mm. uh, by Katna. Um, yeah. uh, and it's so interesting to have a look at, and we'll talk about these later, Pajama Girl Murder Case, Glen Rowan Affair, etc. Um, and some of his early films, which were <laughs> hmm, uh, interesting early films. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, they existed. So, uh -huh. um, and, and that's important. That, so obviously you had a lot of material to begin with, to be able to uh, start the film. Yeah, well, um, I mean, again, 
you know, our century was archival and, you know, that's my speciality. So I was able to get, uh, yeah, surprisingly, the fact that just about all his um, films that he did independently, the short newsreels, were, are in, still in the National Film and Sound Archive. So they're easily accessible. And particularly the pajama uh, girl, uh, pajama uh, girl murder case, which was a one-off ten-minute um, special, um, is still you know still in existence. Which somehow they got into the archive. Um, so looking at them, I was just you know there was so much good material in that footage that spoke again to history and situations in Australian social history we, we didn't know much about. So you know, research sort of took place from that. Um, after that series finished, I spent a lot of time, you know, going to try and find out more about um, Ruth Kapner and found a person who had actually worked with them and some people were still alive who had actually worked with Kapner. And they all kind of, when I'd rang, rang them up, I remember now that I rang them up and they'd, they'd burst out laughing and say, what do you want to know about Rupert Kapner? Because he was such a character in the way he approached everything, um, you know, in this effort to get an, a film made, he'd virtually do anything. So it kind of seemed very colourful. Uh, him and Elmer Brooks, you know, uh, were such colour colourful characters, and there was a lot of really good filmic stories around their adventures that um, I started to think of scripting the the, the idea into the film. Okay, and and again, your approach is so interesting because it's a documentary slash docudrama, uh, and uses that sort of hybrid approach. And yeah. and having Ben Mendelssohn, Victoria Hall playing uh, Rupert and uh, and Alma um, uh, is is such an interesting approach. Where you have uh, um, Paul Katner, the son, yeah. uh, so actual people who are involved, and people playing the people who uh, who were involved uh, in uh, in Katner's life, etc. So all of that and scripting all of that uh, must have been quite a challenge for you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, I I think I started an MA. Um, was, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like in between jobs where you try and get these scripts done. They take so much time, but um, I, at Macquarie University, I started an MA, and someone said, "Oh, you know, if you," I was working there part time, and they said, "Do an MA, and you could do it on Rupert Katner and you know, go further into it." So I was able to get that support. Um, uh, but, but I think the idea of, um, and then when I finished the script, I approached and. I had a list of producers that I wanted to work with and Sue Maslin was on the list. And I sent an email out to Sue and basically said, you know, the story is synopsis and if you'd like to read the script, you'd read it. And, and fantastically, Sue Maslin actually got back to me because most people don't get back to you and said, love the script, you know, let's talk. And so that's our relationship started that from that, yeah. Well, well, Sue, let's bring you into this because producing the film uh, uh, and getting financing, getting um, uh, so much involved because there is so much technical uh, aspects to the film as well, which we'll talk about more, which are so significant. Um, what were the challenges you faced, Sue, in, in trying to get this film off the ground? You'll need to unmute, uh, Sue. <laughs> Uh, firstly, just going back a step, when Alec, you know, sent this story, I could not believe that I had never heard of either Rupert Kaffner or Alma Brooks. And because all of us had been kind of used to this sort of mythology that, uh, you know, Australia had a vibrant, incredibly active feature film industry, shorts in the silent era, you know, production houses were just so busy. Uh, we had cinemas in every country town. We had an unbelievably vibrant industry. And then we lost it and the story went, it, we really didn't um, have any, you know, Australian films to speak of until the late 60s and early 70s when we saw the, uh, the rebirth of the Australian film industry. So then to have this story sent to me where these two characters kept making movies, you know, right through the um, 30s and 40s. And it was sort of like, um, why haven't we heard this story? I mean, it was, it was extraordinary. 
and not to mention that they were rat bags, they were, you know, crooked as all get out. But people seemed to forgive them because every cent that they conned out of people <laughs> went into making these Aussie movies. So they were true believers. And um, so there was something about the spirit that just captured my imagination. And I hadn't worked with Alec. I certainly knew of Alec's uh, very extensive documentary work um, prior to that. So um, I knew that this would be you know, quite a, an interesting ride for the, for the two of us uh, in making this film. But um, it, it was a challenge because not the least of which Alec had found, you know, through his kind of detective work, he'd found a lot of Katniss films. But with the time difference, a lot of people were no longer alive. You know, there's a few people that could talk to. But the worst part was that the Sydney that Kathna inhabited had pretty much been destroyed mm. in the 60s because of all those beautiful old cinemas and buildings and so on had been knocked down. So it was, how are we going to do this, Alec? And that was the real challenge. And Alec, and I'm going to throw to you again, Alec, just this idea, because in 2005, we, we didn't have CGI to solve every problem. It was the very, very beginning of starting to use technology to uh, look at ways of inserting real people or actors into archival footage. This was really, really early stuff back in 2005. So I might throw to you, Alec, you know, what that challenge was. Yeah, uh, um, I think the idea, well, the idea was because um, th there was a number of um, still photographs of Kathner and his productions in the National Film and Sound Archive, but also um, I began to look at uh, lots of photographs in this, particularly the State Library in New South Wales, the Mitchell Library of Sydney at the time, and realising that Sydney had completely changed. I just had this idea that we could do that. Could we do a Sydney, you know, construct a Sydney from those photographs digitally um, as a background, and then we'd we'd impose the actors into that. Um, sometimes it's lucky not to know the technical difficulties that awaited us, but um, at that time it was a lucky timing because it could have been enormously more expensive than what it did cost. I mean, it was more than a normal documentary costing, but. Uh, Lord of the Rings had come out, so there had been advances in digital technology that could actually do this kind of compositing of images together uh, far cheaper than you could previously. You just wouldn't think of it previously. Um, so that sort of um, led me to, you know, think of it in terms of approaching it in that way where we could build Sydney and, and backgrounds out of real images of Sydney. And that's, and that's how it began. So the challenge of producing then was to um, put together a team that mm -hmm. had the technical capacity to help realise Alex's vision. And so that meant if you're going to insert actors into archival, well, first of all, you're going to have to shoot in black and white. Uh, secondly, you're going to need to light it so that it's flawless. And um, thirdly, you're going to need, you know, somebody that, uh, you know, is an artist like Alec as well, that would take the care to create, you know, a world in those um, composite images. And we found that in a wonderful compositor artist, um, Rose Draper, mm. who was able to bring it together. But I have to say, I don't think you could get this film financed now. Um, it's, uh, you know, back, I mean, back in 2005, it was a $1.5 million budget. And um, we haven't seen budgets like that for uh, um, films that have, you know, really strong archival content that have been researched and written with care and then, you know, produced at that production level. Uh, these days, it's almost unimaginable that you could get a film like that uh, fully developed and financed. Well, well, that's incredible to hear what the budget was because, uh, I mean, technically the film looks uh, incredibly uh, good uh, yeah. and uh, also the use of green screen, the use of um, uh, so much uh, uh, interesting footage uh, in, in the film. Um, and I can imagine that... Uh, the editing process to make sure that everything fitted together exactly mm. must have been a, a major challenge. Uh, yeah, uh, well, first of all, you need a Sue Maslin on board. 
and I'm saying that really um, realistically because Sue's probably the best producer I've ever worked with in terms of being very grounded and you know uh, on what is needed to make a production work on all levels and um, and we had a philosophy behind it about how we worked. I mean, even with the budget we had then, we knew it was fairly tight and it could fall, you know, it could fall in a horrible heat quite quickly, that kind of work. Um, but we spent, uh, we got uh, a wonderful cinematographer, Jackie Farkas, who's, who's very brilliant with black and white cinema, uh, camera. Um, and with Sue on board, with Rose Draper on board, who's also technically brilliant, you know, meant has a mind of, um, because we um, we had to be very careful. So we spent four months, there was a three of us, Jackie, Rose and I sitting in a room going through every shot. So it was storyboarded over a four month period to work out the kind of compositing problems that would be faced before we had to shoot. So doing that helped us really prepare for the editing, you know, so um, we were able to do that, and and that really made sure that um, together with um, a person whose name slipped my mind, Sue, who, who just worked in Hollywood, who was working Danny, out all. Danny uh, Cooper. Uh, he he was. Um, oh, Danny Cooper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pathways, the digital pathways. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, his name. I mean, I mean, these, it's, you had to get, it was a very technical job. What I'm saying is, and I'd sit in the room with Jackie and Rose and they'd be talking about them. And my, I, I wouldn't have a clue what they're talking about, you know. So we'd draw it. And, but they, you know, having the right people was Sue's um, great leadership was to have the right people on the, vest, on, the, on the vessel who understood the technical challenges that we were going to meet. Um, and work it out. And so, you know, for instance, um, one of the technical tra challenges would be that if you had a photograph of Night of Sydney and you had the light coming at a certain way, the cinematographer had to have enormous patience to work out how to match that with the actors in the studio. Because if you tried to put them together later on and they didn't match, it would just, you know, just wouldn't work. Um, and so you know, a lot of time was spent, um, you know, trying to match the lighting from a still photograph that was going to be in the background with actors in the studio. And that took a lot of, lot of work and a lot of technical um, expertise to, to achieve that, which to this, this day, I don't know how they did it. I mean, the inventiveness by the more technically minded people and the people who worked on the crew um, that Sue had put together were just, just brilliant. You know, extremely inventive. When we had certain problems, they would all get together and come up with solutions. Well, the film looks incredible. It's almost as if uh, Baz Luhrmann had uh, had been involved uh, shooting, especially that that opening and and where we we travel across Sydney and and uh, etc. It, it looks absolutely incredible. But of course, Baz Luhrmann has a slightly uh, higher budget. Uh, yeah. so <laughs> And, and tell me, what was it like working with Ben and Victoria? Because they must have been uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, well, bemused, perhaps, or interested in your approach to telling the story. Oh, um, I, look, I, it, 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 we, we shot in, well, first of all, we shot in Film Australia studios. They had Film Australia still existed then. They had studios. I think we had two weeks, so didn't we? We had two weeks. Um, but one of um, Ben's problem is he's a method actor and sometimes it would take an extra few hours to set up the lighting on a shot. And, you know, he you know, had to deal with his frustrations at time. Um, um, but uh, things went, you know, pretty much to plan. Um, you know, I mean, this is all where, where Sue as a producer comes in, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, not panic every day, um, but Sue's the kind of the captain of the ship of you know that that gets the whole thing through um, to the other side, really. So maybe Sue can talk about organizing well, the, thing, the whole the thing. challenge. Uh, you know, we had to find an actor that had the same kind of charisma as um, Kathna, 
And of course, um, you know, Ben oh, that's right. all yeah. of that swagger and, uh, you know, that, that confidence and that, you know, incredible Aussie um, voice, if you like, uh, because, you know, the casting, and in fact, I think, you know, that all of the casting needed to capture an Australia of the 30s and 40s. So there were, you know, particular looks that um, we were looking for, but, uh, you know, Ben, um, you know, he, he basically, I think, you know, his, his um, you know, charisma really carries it to a big extent. And then Victoria Hill, Victoria hadn't done a lot of um, performance, but she had the, the, the right kind of look again, um, slightly, you know, she had to be in one part femme fatale and another part bush heroine. You know, Alma could do anything. I thought she was just the most inspiring, wonderful character. And the fact that she, you know, there was just nothing that um, she couldn't do. You wanted, a, you know, an actor that could embody, embody that spirit. And um, Victoria was absolutely up for that as well. But yes, it, it um, I mean, actors these days, are, it's not much fun doing green screen shoots. All of those big Hollywood pictures and so on, they're so technical. They don't get to perform in real locations um, and we got a, just a tiny taste of what that might be like when we were at, sort of in the studio because the time that it takes to set up the shots, the actors, um, you know, it's, it's a very, very different performance style and a very, very different um, requirement on them. I think, and I think the thing about Ben was, Ben was um, the first name that came up wasn't it Sue? Mm. I mean, you know, Sue mentioned what about Ben Mendelssohn? Immediately we went, oh, of course, you know. Um, and it was just lucky that he was available at that timing. So the timing was perfect that we actually got Ben. Um, he was trying to break into Hollywood at that time as well and just happened to be, you know, at the right moment. So, I mean, yes, he, I mean, he's wonderful on screen, you know, and certainly embodied um, the Katna character. Actually, his, his um, Paul Katner said later on that you know it, he really captured Rupert Katner, his father, later on when the film was finished. Yeah. Well, great. Speaking about Paul, how easy was it for him to be involved in the film, and how much advice did he give you uh, in making the film? Oh, I, I I met well. Paul was living in Melbourne. And I met him, you know, during the early days, and he was surprised I was interested in his father. Although, um, you know, it was, it was a mixed relationship with his father, but he was he was really keen on it and really loved the film as it came out and when it came out. Um, so we had a very um, good relationship all the way through it. Uh, and and Paul was a set designer too, and um, you know, sort of understood the sort of creative you know, urges of, of, of his father um, but of course he was he was grew up with his mother more than with with Ruth but he still knew about him and and certainly um, you know supported the, the making of the film and really liked the film when it came out okay so. and it's nice to see a number of other people involved uh like uh, charles tingwell who oh. interestingly enough was the narrator for um glenn rowan affair uh so i, I found that uh, that uh, worked very nicely and andrew pike's in there and uh, robert bruning etc jonathan hardy you've you found some really interesting people to play particular roles of of the real life uh, people mm. involved at the mm. time i think um it was great having them in there. I mean, Charles was delightful, of course, to work, you know, to, and, and very generous, but also the fact that they were part of an older generation of, you know, Australian film made it special too. You know, it was, it was, a, it was a film that we were all, everybody working on it kind of felt we were doing something about Australian film industry, you know, that hadn't been told. And particularly, you know, the, 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 the battles against the Hollywood uh, monolith in Australia um, and and you know um, Charles you know they all had their story about Rupert Katna everybody had a pride in having at least one story about Rupert Katna because it was a very small industry too um, so everybody knew each other and of course Katna's name was you know bandied around those who either really loved him for being the kind of character he was or really hated him you know for who he was um, it's a bit like Longford you know um, 
he, they, 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 Longford and Cat knew, Cather had knew Longford a little bit. And so there was a lot of history, you know, for me, the, the interest was about the connection to history and of Australian film. I think we've come back to bite us in the bum a little bit because Andrew Pike, um, who wrote a really definitive history of the early Australian cinema, Catherine appears pretty much as a footnote. Um, oh, Catherine right. was not a great, he was not a great um, artist by any means, um, but he did make these films, but he, he, he'd been overlooked by the film historians and nobody really took his work seriously. He was kind of like the Ed Wood of, you know, Australian film, yeah. film if you like. Yeah. So um, when came the day for Alec and I to um, pitch the film to the ABC, <laughs> we, and you know, I flew up to Sydney, met up with Alec and said, no, look, Alec, we've got a meeting you know, with the uh, commissioning editor of um, ABC, ABC Arts, we'll go in and pitch the film. And the minute we arrived and we sat down, I think it happened in about the first two minutes, the commissioning editor just said, well, this guy's a nobody. Why would you make a film about that? We're not going to be funding a film about, you know, he doesn't even appear in Andrew Pike's book. You know, it's just a kind of a footnote. He's a footnote of history. That was the word that was yeah. used. Yeah. And we'd gone in there, you know, I was, oh, yeah, they're going to love this. You know, it's an Australian story. It's an Australian history about our, about our past, you know. No. Um, and then the whoever, the head of the department, I remember leaning into Sue and sort of, Tutting Sue about how stupid she was for trying to make this documentary about a nobody on such a big budget. It wasn't. It wasn't 1.5 million then. It was less than a million. And we sort of. I remember we reeled out of there, Sue and I, and we ended up in Chinatown ordering all this Chinese food to try and get ourselves set our senses back to just what happened. We virtually got thrown out down the stairs. You know, like... And then I said, Alec, I mean, you can imagine how devastating it was for Alec. He'd spent years researching the story. So I said, let's just catch our breath. I got on the phone and rang another uh, commissioning editor um, who was uh, in the ABC and said, hey, look, you know, we're in town. We're just down the road in Chinatown. Can we pop up and... Uh, come and meet you and um he said yeah sure you know come up and have a chat and we sat in his office and within about 10 minutes he said that sounds amazing send me the script and then the rest is history so you just like Katna and Alma you just don't take no for an answer and Daryl and I've been making films for years and every time you know every film gets knocked back every film gets a no yeah. every film you know whether it's timing or it's whatever you, you it's um, you just have to have a very very thick skin, and then you just keep going back and back and back until you finally get it made. And sometimes it can take years. It's interesting, Sue, because that's so much so relevant to the Kathna Kath story. You know, that's mm. that's him, and I think every filmmaker in Australia feels like Rupert Kathna at some point, for sure. <laughs> you know, where they're just sitting their head against a brick wall, and um, you know, unfortunately, I. You know, watching the film again, um, <clears throat> it's a tragedy. It really is. I mean, there's some wonderful comic moments and it's a fantastic historical film that tells a, a particular story about Australian history, but it's a tragedy. It really is, you know, that, that um, Australian filmmaking hasn't... I still feel like we're back there right now or quickly heading back there, you know, and that, that really is sad. Um, yeah. And you would have hoped, you know, in the last uh, 12 years since you made the film, 12 or 16 years, that things would have been looking a lot yeah. rosier, you know, um, but instead it's... it's Gone backwards. Well, yeah. the, par yeah. the, the parallels are, are very evident. Like right at the moment we have this kind of booming production uh, activity in Australia and a lot of it's uh, driven by um, American, mostly American, but it, you know, international companies coming down here, working with our crews. Um, we are making films for Netflix and Amazon and all the, you know, the, all of the, um, the benefits, the intellectual property is all owned by offshore companies. 
the um, the rewards for those films um, go back offshore. You know, in many ways, it's just the streamers have replaced the studios, but we're kind of right back where we started from. And right at the moment, it's harder than ever to get local um, Australian feature films made. That's very sad to hear that. And uh, yes, as you say, it, it uh, mimics going back to that time. And I suppose the ABC and others would have thought too in the 30s, 1930s, uh, when uh, Katna was uh, pretty much starting to, to make some films and to uh, uh, evolve an Australian film industry. I mean, Kenji Hall and, and a few others were making Australian films. Uh, and yet they were still under the aegis of the American uh, sort of uh, companies and distributors and, uh, uh, and exhibitors, etc. cetera. So um, really he was trying to break away completely from that notion that uh, Australian film profits should be going overseas. Well, the vast bulk of, uh, you know, like we have uh, around 2000 cinemas in, in Australia and, um, you know, it's about a $2 billion industry, but the, the bulk of that, you know, around 85% of it is actually driven by, you know, the US studios. So um, Australia sits in the remaining 15%, and on average, you know, it's around, you know, 4 to 5% each year is our share of box office for our own films. So we still are very much a minority in our own culture, and we, we don't value it particularly highly. The only difference at the moment is, and this is why I'm so passionate about the, um, the Australian fil feature film sector, is that for the first time, we've managed to get the exhibitors, the distributors, the filmmakers, the investors, the screen agencies, all recognising that, uh, you know, we, we actually have to come together and work differently if we are to, um, to keep an Australian feature film industry going. Because in the face of, you know, the streaming, uh, we cannot take it for granted. It, it may disappear uh, if, if we don't um, really work together in uh, really valuing Australian stories on our big screens. Mm. Here, here, I absolutely support that. And I hope uh, something uh, uh, can be made, uh, an accord of some sort, like we've just had the job summit. We should have the Australian <laughs> Film Summit. We did, like Peter. That. We did last year. I hope you attended. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't able to. <laughs> but no, it was great that that happened. But uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Hunt Angels, because uh, I don't think a lot of people would perhaps uh, understand the title, because hunting for an angel to fund uh, an Australian film is, of course, what's behind that title. But mm. did you wrestle at all with the idea of calling the film something else? Oh, yeah, I wrestle all the time. Um, I, I'm a bit blank. To Sue, do you remember? I mean... <laughs> I, I can't, I can't uh, for the life of me think. Um, well, nobody really knew what it meant particularly. So no. having to educate uh, yeah, people, yeah, yeah. And it, you know, it meant that in our publicity materials and so on, that we really had to explain what the expression meant. Yeah. Uh, and I remember David Stratton saying he loved the film, but why did you pick that title? You know, so um, yeah, blame, blame me if no one understands it. <laughs> um, but Katna, I think it, you know, you become obsessed with the, with the person and um, Katna used that name um, as an alias amongst others, was one of his aliases was Hunt Angels. And it was probably a word that was used within that world of theatre and film in those days uh, quite readily and people understood its meaning. Uh, it, prob it just probably doesn't translate as well today. Mm. One of his uh, interesting films and, and how he worked with the police department or didn't as the case might be, Pyjama Girl's uh, murder uh, case, oh. uh, girl murder case. Uh, it's so interesting how he approached that and how he then uh, reenacted it so that he could make a, a, a film uh, that would uh, tantalise the audience because he, he was interested in social realism to some extent. Yeah, I, I think one of the things now that I going back to one of the things that really struck me about um, Katner and Alma Brooks's films is the energy in it. You know, there was a kind of energy with it. It was, it was kind of racy stories. And, and for an Australian film to talk so openly about something like a contemporary murder was very unusual. And to do it in a way that was um, 
uh, of, of a style that wasn't uh, was far more pacier than the the other newsreels, which was a Fox movie tone and um, cine sound, who of course never touched crime very much at all in those days. In fact, um, films couldn't, you know, newsreels couldn't come into Australia with stories like, you know, Dillinger and Bonnie and Clyde. They were, they were always um, censored before they could get in. And Australia had a huge censorship problem with film. Um, the police, uh, you know, with the commission of police in each state was a censor of films as well as the customs department. So there, there was um, in Australian history, uh, a massive censorship up until you know the early 70s or late 60s um, which was something that fascinated me of a, the Australian society that um, was known overseas that if you if you were sending a, in America mainly with Hollywood films and English films of course which made up a lot of films in Australia at that time they had a special department for actually editing the films for Australia specifically because of the censorship problem and that fascinated me as well but so so Kathner was always skating around that area too about what he could tell and not tell um, and um, there seemed to be um, although not so specifically written that Longford had problems with police as well you know with with um, trying to do subject matter in Australia which was seen as something that you shouldn't touch of course Bush Ranger films earlier on from 1912 to the mid 40s, um, which Kathner got involved with the Glen Rowan affair, were banned for making in New South Wales and or screening in New South Wales. So, so there is a history of censorship, which was my fascination as well about how Kathner was trying to overcome that problem in, in telling Australian stories. Mm. Uh, but, but it was um, it's one of my favourite kind of short films. But yeah, well, I mean, it's outstanding when you look at the other kind of films that were made in Australia at that time. They usually, because it was expensive, you know, to make films in those days. So it was usually a bigger companies that could make them. But mostly they would be rather dull films made to lure British migrants to Australia by selling the beauty of, you know, North Queensland or something like that. And, and quite dull, you know. Um, uh, earnest kind of government films and then the newsreels and occasionally feature films. So in that sense, to me, Katna stood out as a very interesting um, aspect of Australian filmmaking that had been left out of the, of the histories. Yes. It's very obvious, isn't it? When, like you and I, Alex, have probably gone through the film archives from, you know, right going right back and looking at them, and something like what um, Catherine was doing is so rare. You know, mm -hmm. for example, I was working on a film about Frank Hardy for a long time, and his trial in 1950-51 was massive. So every paper in the country carried, you know, pages of photographs and stories about him right throughout that trial. And when I spoke to him, I said, so the newsreel guys must have got a lot of stuff. He said, no, nah, they never showed up. They never did one foot of filming of my trial, you know, which is just staggering um, when you think about how important historically that moment was and they just stayed away. They were given instructions, no, never cover that. So Kathna is very unusual when he goes into those sort of areas. Mm. That's actually right. I mean, yeah, they never touched things. I mean, it's really rare to find in newsreels anything about the depression. Um, you know, the real, the reality, the social realities of, of Australia, um, unless they're more, you know, a bit later on the fifties, propaganda, anti-communist propaganda. Um, but yeah, so that that that's something you become aware of when you when you go through the archives or you're working with archival film. And I, I and given that. Sort of understanding of the archives. That's why Katna stood out to me. Was was he was a kind of different, coming from a different angle. 
And, and the other thing he was so keen about was uh, during wartime, of course, World War II, is to try and make a film about the rats of Tobruk. Um, and he uh, also tried to make a film called, is it Wings of Destiny? which I think was funded by a trapeze artist, uh, which (laughs) talk about a hunt angel. So uh, it's interesting to see the sorts of things that he was trying to get off the ground and met with so much resistance. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, there were stories about Rats of Tobruk, about did he sell the rights to Chevelle? Um, You know, um, there's a lot of stuff he couldn't put in, in the film, but there was a lot of intrigue around Kathna and um, people trying to sue him and being there. <laughs> um, so it's sort of, in, you know, um, the, the intrigue was, was something that fascinated me about, you know, what we don't know about the film industry. Um, you know, it, it's, um, it, it, it just, I, I like that detective work of research where you uncover certain things. Um, yeah, I'm sort of remembering now finding the original script of, you know, uh, I think in the National Film and Sound Archive, the original script of Rats of Tobruk that Kaplan had written. And then I think he couldn't get the money and he sold it to Chevelle, who sold the title. And then somebody sued for that title or something. I can't remember. There was a lot of, a lot of kind of intrigue going on around these things. So what made him eventually decide to make a film about Ned Kelly? Not that it hadn't been done before, of course, but uh, the Glen Rowan affair, because, uh, again, I suppose that echoed his interest in telling Australian stories. Uh, yeah. Um, I think um, the, the Ned Kelly story had always been something very popular uh, in Australia, even in theatre before film existed. And the Glenn Rowan story was something he wanted to do because it was coming out of a period where there'd been an actual ban on making films about Ned Kelly and Bush Rangers. So he was wanting to capture, uh, get a film made that would capture that kind of spirit, that that very Australian story. Um, But I remember um, discovering, remember Sue, uh, I discovered, I went went to, where was it, Benalla, yeah, and and I asked around because that's where they filmed it. And one of the hotels had a couple of Kathma paintings because he also also was a painter, and he had so, had that Elma and him had stayed in Benalla to to set up the filming, and they'd paid for their um, accommodation by a couple of paintings, and they still have a couple of roof, a couple of roof, roof and a Kathma, Rupert Kathma paintings in the hotel. But I said, do you know anybody who might be around who remembered Kathna? And they directed me to this <laughs> most rundown farm I've ever seen in my life. It was like the half the side of the building was falling in on the other half, you know, it was leaning against the other half. And this guy came out and he was in his 90s. And he actually had the helmet, the Ned Kelly helmet from the Glen Rowan affair. And 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 said that Katner had actually shot. I mean, we got a little bit on. I filmed him, a, a bit of him um, talking. Um, but he had he had in his kitchen this rundown kitchen the helmet that they'd actually used in the Ned Kelly film, and and he actually had shot on that farm. So Sue and I went to visit him. <laughs> we drove down to Benalla in the early days when we were working together to meet this gentleman. Who, who's in the film? I forgot his name. And, and then we actually took the film back. Um, we we had a screening in the little um, country town just That's outside right. of Benalla. Um, it was one of the very first screenings we did, I think, Alec. It was a very yeah. early one, and of course everybody came. Uh, that you, could, you know, well remembered when uh, the Glen Rowan affair was filming down the road because everyone had family members mm. <laughs> that were involved one way or another. How interesting to hear all that. Let, let's talk about the distribution of the film because the film was released in, I think, uh, 2006. Mm-hmm. And I noticed Antonio Zecola, yeah. uh, Palace, were, was involved as executive producer. How did all that work together in trying to get the film into cinemas? Oh, it's a wonderful story, actually, because to- Antonio Zecola, um, his story almost uh, encapsulates the Catherine spirit as well because... 
Uh, his father imported Italian and Greek films in the uh, 1950s, you know, where they immigrated out you know, post Second World War. And they had little, you know, picture houses dotted around, you know, the northern suburbs of Melbourne. And Tony, as a young guy, would actually have a bicycle. And in those days, films came in reels. So, you, you know, you had, you know, three, four or five reels. And um, Tony's job was to, you know, when a, a film was screening in one of his father's cinemas, he would take off the first three reels, put them in the basket and then pedal up buggery to the next cinema and you know, get that cinema started and then go back and get the, the next two reels. And anyway, so he he just, you know, film was in his DNA. Um, he loved it. And so I had had a, another film with, with him, um, Japanese Story, and that had done extremely well for Palace Films as a distributor. And I knew Tony's love for cinema. So... I rang him up one day and um, said, oh, I'd like to take you out for lunch. We'll go to this Italian you know, restaurant in, in Melbourne. And we had a long lunch. They were the days of long lunches. You don't do that anymore either. <laughs> and I started just telling him um, the story, the, you know, the story of Rupert Catherine. And he hadn't heard of uh, Rupert and Alma either. And by the end of the lunch, he said, yep, I'm in. That's never happened before, I can tell you. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, no, it was a great story. He was very passionate about the film as well. So Palace um, Films did do the, um, the release. Uh, the film, when it came out in 2006, it actually won Best Documentary Film at the um, AFI Awards, now the Act Australian Academy Awards. Yep. And that um, really was the kind of platform then for, for releasing it. It had a modest release. And then finally uh, we did uh, screen it on ABC TV. Uh-huh. And, and now it's back to you, I gather. You you have the rights to it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Well, how these things tend to happen is um, a you know, distributor for a feature film release uh, will typically have, you know, the rights for around 15 years. And so that the rights came up again. I got in touch with Alec, it was it earlier this year, and said, look, how about um, we actually get the rights back and particularly because of this resurgence of interest in we you know in Australian feature films and the parallels between Hunt Angels and what we experience now um, I just want everybody to see Hunt Angels and uh, just to, to recognize you know nothing much has changed and in the words of Rupert Kathner and that beautiful scene in the film where he's uh, making the case for Australian film in front of the judge and Alec, correct me if I'm wrong, but I did that um, the the scripting of that scene and his impassioned plea. Did it actually come from a, a court transcript or from his book? Yeah, from a, from his book, uh, Kathleen wrote a book um, in his own style about the Australian film industry, which I got a copy of. Um, but that's that's where we got I got a lot of his dialogue from, and he made this passionate plea for Australian cinema. And um, in his own kind of, it's almost the beauty of the book is that he kind of wrote it as he spoke, you know, so you can imagine Kathna speaking it. And so we use that in the courtroom scene where he makes a passionate plea for making our stories. Yeah. So um, luckily, he, you know, that book, I was able to find a copy of it. What a, what a history is attached to the film. It's, it's uh, fascinating to really explore this even further. We'll take questions from uh, everyone else in a moment. Uh, has Hunt Angels had any sort of currency overseas? Not really. Um, it's, uh, it was certainly picked up by Fortissimo Films, who um, was the sales agent for... Um, I'd worked with them previously on a Japanese story, but... It made a few sales, but people just felt it was um, a little bit too parochial. It was a very Australian story. And, um, but, uh, to, you know, to give Fortissimo uh, credit, they, they really responded to the storytelling, to, you know, the approach of um, the hybrid, you know, and, you know, the uh, sort of documentary, documentary drama, but, you know, the black and white aesthetic. And when I sort of said to them, well, just think of it in terms of Ed Wood meets Bonnie and Clyde. You know, that, that was the kind of moment <laughs> that they thought they would take it on. <laughs> That's a great description. I like that. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
That's a beauty. All right. Uh, there's obviously lots more to talk about, but I think it's uh, important now we get some questions from uh, everyone who's part of this uh, discussion. So uh, feel free now to uh, ask questions of Alex, Sue and Daryl. Um, I have a question. Um, who was the journal? Uh, who Who was the journo who Kafka um, told when he, the journo that um, Kafka spoke to when he, um, when he uh, spoke, uh, when he reported that he, uh, the letter he had written to himself that led to the article being printed. So the Pajama Girl murder mystery and the letter that, um, you know, Kathna had done, mm. which was a fake letter sort of saying this production must not go ahead. Is that this film? Must yes, yes. yes. That's, uh, I, I, I had a, a, uh, an echo in my uh, system. I've now left that system yeah you're was, fine now yeah that was very um off-putting for me <laughs> yeah that was the scene yeah and uh by the way congratulations to you both on making um uh, this film uh, which i really enjoyed well, and thank you. Um, my my first comment was um the speech that um uh, he made uh, to the judge which led to the judge funding the film and uh, stating his aims for film. Yeah, yeah but who was the journo? I can't, I can't recall, sorry. I've yeah, got a blank that, on that one. That's, that's all right. And, yeah. and uh, why wasn't it, uh, I noticed that it was um, shown at Melbourne Film Festival, uh, yeah. but... Um, First of all, where was his house? I know he moved from um, Adelaide to Sydney. Where, where was his house in Sydney? Oh, he lived um, in Bondi. Yeah, he lived but um, quite... why, uh, in the light of that, why mm. wasn't it shown? I noticed that it was shown at the Brisbane and Melbourne Film Festival. Oh, why wasn't it? Why Sydney wasn't Film it Festival? shown at Sydney? Well, there's a story behind that. Oh. <laughs> Sue can tell us. Oh, story. no, you, you tell Alec. I can't remember. <laughs> well, well um, we thought it should open the Sydney Film Festival. Um, and then we were kind of, you know, went to Sydney Film Festival and they accepted it. And then they sort of slotted it somewhere, which we thought was pretty not, you know, not good for the film. Um, and we said, no, you need to put it on. You know, it's a Sydney film. This is about Sydney film history. You know, you need, you know, just stop trying to hide it under the bushes, something like that. Probably a bit more arrogantly. Um, but um, so we, we would, they wouldn't, they wouldn't shift. And they had, um, and so we went to Melbourne. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, we kind of felt, you know, this is this is this is about Australian film industry history. Yeah, exactly. And it was being treated, you know, a bit shabbily, so we just withdrew it and put it on in Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I really liked the dancing figures in front of the photos. The photo in front of the photo, you know, the effect that had. I, I really like that. Oh, thank you, thank you. And yeah, I mean, I mean, um, I mean, it would as as a, as a director, um, you know, a great credit to Rose Draper. I think we could afford one and a half digital compositors. <laughs> about, but um, yeah, a lot of that work is great credit to Rose Draper. Um, I mean, we were editing the film. We had stills, still photographs or still images of some of the things that going to, were going to be put together and made beautiful. 
and when we were editing, Rose was working in the room next to us, and basically we didn't dare stick our head in when they were working so furiously during a Melbourne summer. We edited in Melbourne um, because a lot of the production money came from Melbourne eventually, and we edited in Melbourne. Tony Stevens, the wonderful Tony Stevens. Um, and so Rose would come in and show us uh, what she'd done and we'd just be over the moon because we'd only just seen, you know, rough copies of what she was working on. So when we, it was such a surprise to us to see the high level that Rose had created the compositing where she spent an enormous amount of, you know, probably burnt, you know, a million brain cells doing the whole thing, but, you know, would come in with these incredibly beautiful pieces um, and show us in the edit room and we'd cut them in as, as we were still cutting the film. So yeah, it was quite a treat to see a lot of that footage for us, you know, personally as well. Also, I wanted to comment on the red title uh, with the black and white film. I think that was very effective. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you, yeah. Um, Anyway, and, and I like the fact that the, um, the, this one guy played 27 characters in the Glen Rowan affair. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, um, but um, what I wanted to say was that um, the film reminded me of Newsfront all the way through, uh, you know, the... Um, I, I kept thinking of uh, movie tone news and mm. cine sound and the battle they had when the um, TV came, came yeah. in. And, um, but um, also I was reminded that Wim Wenders uh, said of Germany, of, of, uh, in Germany, that um, this, he lived in um, the American quarter, I guess, of, uh, and he said uh, that the Americans had uh, colonized our subconscious. Mm. And I, I thought that was very telling as well. Mm, which was part of the German new wave to reclaim German cinema. Yes. Um, Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Australia in, is, is like many, many other smaller nations where the domination, historically as well, I mean, Hollywood's been involved in Australia really since the end of the, well, during the First World War when they moved in um, and took over the cinemas until the late 40s. Um, but it is a colonisation, uh, you know, of, of our story telling i mean i was shocked to read i mean i haven't been touched but with as 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 much detail as sue has who works on the ground to get australian films you know a hearing for australian films but i did you know just read the other day that the quotas for children australian children's television has virtually been slashed by the previous government and there's virtually no Australian productions being made for children's television apart from the ABC. So all the commercial channels are not doing any productions because the quota has been lifted. I, I find it horrifying. I, I mean, the word the colonization is, um, it, it, is, it is quite horrifying to live even the past few years with, because it always goes back to my father, you know, who was a builder and wanted us to all enter the building trade and be tradies. And I was this kid who drew and wrote stories and he, you know, was a dreamer and he sort of warned me, you know, look, that <laughs> this is not a good place to go, you know, um, you know, to, to realize that the areas of interest that I'm interested in, like the filmmaking industry has been, you know, certainly hacked at and slashed at, you know, the, the universities which have backed me, like Macquarie has backed me in many ways, you know, have been slashed and, you know, the, the humanities, which I you know, used to work in, have been slashed. I mean, there's been a whole assault that seems to come around in Australia on thinking new ideas and having new ideas. Um, and and I, I, I'd certainly found the last few years, um, you know, uh, and particularly during the time uh, 
the Howard era and particularly for Australian history was a really dark time, uh, you know, with the black armband sort of mentality. And, and I still find today we're still grappling with the problem of telling our own stories. Um, which I, try, I, I kind of, um, I find, uh, you know, that we have so many great stories that have been yet untold in Australia, really, really have, we haven't really dug into Australia, really got into Australia. And, you know, there's, uh, there's this constant uh, assault on the ability to tell our own stories. Uh, that, that's, you know, like, that's why I go to the gym. Right. You know, I mean, there's only one way to keep uh, above that is to just, you know, keep moving forward, as I know Sue does. You know, that's why I love to be in touch with people like Sue, who's been out there and has, I know has had enormous battles with her visions and has won some great victories. But it is like that. You do feel that you're under assault by a kind of mindset in Australia that doesn't like new ideas and doesn't like certain things to be told about its past. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased that we got Hunt Angels made. And I, I, I'm always deeply grateful, as with the new one, a blaze of the people I work with, like Sue, and, um, because, you know, I only can do so much. You know, I'm not good at the fundraising and the money and the organisation side of it. And, I'm always deeply grateful for people like Sue and, and Daryl who come, came into Hunt Angels to actually get it realized. You know, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, personally, I think uh, I, I wanna tell stories of this part of the world. You know, I, I realized that, you know, I was colonized growing up, you know, from our generation, I grew up in New Zealand where I realized, you know, we got 1066 and we were told that our culture was in England, you know, like, you know, our best writer was locked up in a psychiatric hospital, Janet Frame. Mm. Um, you know, we didn't have any painters. We didn't see any New Zealand films. And um, I went over to England to go to art school and realised this is not, I have no connection to this. You know? um, so it's, it's, it's strange to live in a society which you call your own and, and you, you know about the place and you, you find so much resistance, particularly when you need funding to actually tell your stories, why there's such a resistance to the telling of Australian stories, particularly those that make us uncomfortable with that. You know, um, that's, that's just where I, that's where I come from. <laughs> um, I think there's some beautiful stories yet to be told, but, you know, like Hunt Angel. You know, um, if it wasn't for people like Sue who picked up, <laughs> I remember sending, a, sending the, the copy to another producer, it was Christmas time. Oh, I just sent the email out, which I sent to Sue saying, if you want to read the script I wrote about Hunt Angels, the story with the synopsis. And I got from the producer was, it's Christmas time, I'm not working, don't send me any emails, you know, like. <laughs> and the difference is you get a Sue Maslin who says, this is wonderful. Come on, let's go and make it. You know, it's a real cat. Sue embodies that Elmer, Elmer Brooks um, kind of mentality. You go out and you make it, you know. And um, I think um, the, the, the tragedy now is it's very hard to get um, Australian historical, social and political films made you know, as one-off films. Um, we've now inherited broadcast television that is obsessed with um, factual entertainment, reality shows, presenter-led. I mean, we need someone like, you know, Miriam Margulies traveling around Australia to tell uh, us about our Australian character. This, this, is, this is what broadcasters want now. And we've had successive years of um, cutbacks. Yes, we've completely lost the quotas um, now for not only children's television, but also documentary and drama. So there is no onus whatsoever on broadcast television to, um, to make any of those kind of films. And of course, for the commercials, they're not doing it because it's expensive and there's no onus on them to do it. So now, you know, everything's moving into the streaming sphere, but you look at the streamers and of course it's dominated by the big companies, you know, Apple TV, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu and so on. Um, and again, there's no, um, there's no quota, there's no minimum spend requirement. Um, 
you know, we're just in their hands as to what they think uh, will work, you know, for the, the streaming market, which is certain kinds of high concept, big stories, but they're certainly not the Australian social, political, historical, you know, the stories that culturally we need to keep telling to our own people. So it's it's got harder now than, than ever to make these one-off films. And um, and it's great seeing Shane Gould here because Shane and I have been trying to get, you know, a film up as well, uh, you know, with ABC and we've, you know, there's been a lot of difficulty, you know, about the culture of swimming in this country. You know, we really need to pull apart the myth that we're a swimming culture and Shane spent years in research and has written a thesis on exactly this subject. But um, even that is um, proving really, really difficult to, um, to get financed in this current climate. So this is what we're up against. And, you know, this is why a film like Hunt Angels, I watched it again for the first time in 15 years. And I sort of felt on the one hand elated, it was such a beautiful film, but on the other hand, utterly depressed that um, the situation hasn't changed significantly really since, you know, what he was dealing with in the mm -hmm. 1930s and 40s. And it all comes back to how we value our culture, our artists, our writers, our stories. Mm -hmm. And and so yeah. I must and I must congratulate you, Sue and uh, Alec, for a blaze. Um, certainly with a nomination for best documentary at the Actor Awards, but also telling such an important and significant story that again not many people would uh, would know about. Tom Sabricki mm. is the producer of that that film. Um, worked very closely with Alec. Um, I, I certainly supported them, but it's Alec and Tom's film. Right. It, it was it was Alec and Tom uh, team that got tossed out of the ABC, not the Alec and Sue team. With <laughs> did you get tossed I mean, out for that too? We got tossed out. Yeah, we got <laughs> tossed out. Look, you know they said, look, um, it's a niche film, Alec. Um, <laughs> it's a niche film. But look, that and they're still doing the same thing. The ABC they finally took it on to screen it, but they didn't put it on the main ABC. They put it on ABC Plus. And Tom finally got a, you know, we were horrified. They never told us. Um, and then on streaming, but we finally got only yesterday, it was put on NADOC week that uh, they did very little publicity. They did little selling. They put it on plus rather than the main ABC channel. And Tom wrote the Terraki and I and Tom were just disgusted at our treatment. And um, we just got a reply just a couple of days ago after months, as saying that they didn't think it was mainstream enough to go on the ABC. And this is where you go, but you're the ABC. What, what is the ethics of having a national broadcaster when we're going to have a referendum coming up and we're going to deal with, you get told that we don't know enough about our past, we don't have a knowledge on our past, and here's a work that provides, you know, evidence of, um, as one writer in the Sydney Morning Herald said it, if Bill Onus, which the film is about, was a white person, there would be statues to him in every street corner. And here is the ABC saying it should go in the arts category, you know, and it's not an art film at all. So we still have a problem with responsibility and ethics with our national broadcaster as to what is the responsibility of telling. Is it, is it that you only screen things that are comfortable to your audience um, or do you show do you have a responsibility to screen something that's in the national more in a broader sense of a national interest even though it's an uncomfortable past that we need to examine if we're going to decide on a referendum coming up um, so yeah we're still dealing with that you know today i mean yeah we got tossed out of every funding body um, the, the, we were lucky we got to turn around that umbrella entertainment, you know, for, for a blaze, loved it and, and sort of backed us. And then that started to turn things a bit. But, um, yeah, that was a struggle as well. Uh, it, it's just a struggle continuously. And you have very little funds to back things. Um, you know, it, it's a struggle because you don't have enough money for an Australian production to make people aware that it even exists, you know, so you don't have the pub. I mean, the, the thing that we're up against with the Hollywood film is that every, the package arrives in our cinemas already been tested with audiences, already having the publicity worked out, already having the money behind it. And yet we, 
you know, as a documentary filmmaker, we have to do everything ourselves. It's incredibly exhausting work to actually um, try and get people just to get the bums on the seats to, to show that, you know, our films have some worth. So it's a very unbalanced kind of situation uh, in Australia. And uh, when you're up against this continual kind of attitude that either people won't take risks or they just remain um, stubbornly refusing to acknowledge the past in Australia, um, you know, the uncomfortableness that it will bring uh, with our history. Uh, so um, I, I just, you know, I, I know a lot of stories that I, that I know of that I just think are absolutely wonderful, but I sort of, you know, you sort of go, oh, could I spend another six years, you know, being tossed out of the ABC again? It's that sort of thing. I mean, I, I'm foolish enough to sort of know that, well, well, you know, and that's probably why they put Chinatown next. That's probably why they built the ABC next to Chinatown. So all those producers who are thrown out can go down and have a, you know, gobble on some food to sort of try and get over the shock of, you know, and we've been tossed out of the ABC again, you know. I mean, we don't even get in the door of Channel 9 or 10 or 7 or some of those people with a lot more money. Um, but you, you're dealing with the mentality that I'm finding today is rather weird to me. I find it strange. I think, and I only could say this, um, I'm not a big social media user, but I think social media has played a big part in it as well, that now we have access to the whole world and there's sort of hard to get um, an interest in, you know, something specifically Australian uh, or even, uh, that's only my guessing. I, I only can sort of speculate what, what the kind of atmosphere is around today. But it's not a good atmosphere, I find. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, with, with a new government and perhaps new thinking that people will start to come around, that we should start to, you know, have more debates and discussion about ideas. Because I find one of the things with the last nine years of the other government was was ideas and you know intelligent ideas were sort of out the window, and I think that that really starts to kill something off in Australia that I you know I find vital about the Australian characters such as Rupert Kattner and Alma Brooks. I mean they were fighting against you know, the system as well, but um yeah so. You know, Sue knows, I know that Sue's always struggling to get her documentaries with the achievement that Sue's had. I'm always shocked. You sometimes think, you know, like Sue's proven herself with some really incredible films and yet still finds it hard to get something like the Shane Gould film going. Um, I, I just can't put it together as to what is the blockage that goes on, you know, I, I'm not a savvy to get into the subconscious of some of these executives who've got the money um, and the purse strings to the money. But um, anyway. Uh, you, so, you win, you, some, win, some you win, uh, some you lose. Yeah, very important and valuable comments and we really do must tell our own stories. It's just so, so important. I wanted to ask, is this two disc version of uh, Hunter Angels, especially with uh, Katniss Films uh, involved um, uh, and on the second disc, is that available in some way? Yes, in fact, we're <laughs> distributing it from um, Film Art Media. Great. So um, now, because we, as I said, we've just um, recently got the rights back from Palace Films. So um, yeah, we, we will be distributing. Uh, the film will be making it available through streaming, which will probably be how most people will get to see um, the film going forward. Uh, but I, I'm actually really keen to use some of the excerpts from the film um, and particularly that wonderful speech by Kath, no, no, the judge, as well as the sort of summary of what happened to the Australian film industry first time around to get these kind of clips out so people recognise that here we go again, a full circle. Mm. <laughs> yeah. oh, great. That's, that's excellent to hear. All right. Are there any uh, final questions from... Yes, uh, I, yes I've please. got one. Uh, at what um, Frank Hardy film was Daryl Delora... Uh, working on. Okay, so Daryl and I, um, some years ago, 
um, had been trying to get a documentary film about Frank, Frank Hardy and his life and work. And again, we were told it was too niche. So it, um, we, we were never able to get it financed, uh, tragically. So well, you, you got the yeah, niche as well, without glory was yeah. on, um, yeah. yeah. So it was looking at all of that, the Power Without Glory trial. And of course, Hardy's story is equally as fascinating. And, you know, Daryl's approach was to, like um, Alec, you know, was to weave the, fi the fiction and the non-fiction elements together. Because in fact, that's what Hardy did throughout his, um, throughout his life and his writing. So, um, oh, I don't know if we'll ever get that one off the ground. Uh, fun, I've got a funny story to tell. Um, one day uh, after uh, uh, after a film was shown at, at the uh, at the uh, film festival, and um, Frank Hardy's son was saying he'd um, lived with the idea of his. He was known as Frank Hardy's son, but now that uh, Marika was. Um, uh, involved in um, on TV, he was known as he, her father. That's right. Ellen <laughs> uh, Hardy. Ellen Hardy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, can I um, just come in with a, um, a short comment? Um, yes. Uh, you might notice how how often Raymond Longford appears in bit parts in Catherine's films. Mm. And yes. Um, now he was, uh, I guess, down on his luck by then. But um, mm. uh, but there he is playing, you know, um, yeah, just playing these small parts. Mm. And in Canberra, there is a street named after Rip Kastner. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. Uh, it's in the suburb of Chapman. Mm. The whole suburb is named after film personalities, Australian film personalities. Uh, and who was behind that? Andrew Pike. Yeah. Yes. When he was a young civil servant. Uh, he was deputed to um, work on the name, street name for the, the next suburb, you know. So uh, um, he did some research. So, uh, uh, so all the names had to be things that were names that weren't already used and the people were dead. That was the, that was the requirement. Um, and they could publish something with a you know short bio of each of them. So Cathana Street, maybe, maybe symbolically, is on the edge of the suburb. That's right, yeah, yeah. And, and it's very long. <laughs> It's very long and it's, um, yeah, that's right. And Andrew Pike told me about that and I uh, went and took some photographs and it's, there's one side is the houses, suburban houses and the other side is an empty field. Yeah. yeah. And there's a great story. Uh, Andrew snuck it through. He didn't think it would get through, but he put the name down on the list and it got through. He, he thought they'd strike it off, but it actually got through. <laughs> so there is a Catna Street in, uh, in Canberra. But um, I mean, that's another thing, Ray, uh, you know, one of the things that has been at, under attack in Australia, as well as, you know, the humanities, is our archives. Absolutely. I, I, I you know, I, I cannot understand a society that allows itself to denigrate its past so badly. I, I, I just find it, you know, because I, I'm personally involved, I suppose I know something about it, but it, it seems to miss everybody's attention that, you know, I'd go to Canberra and once the National Film and Sound Archive used to make their own films um, to get people in, and there would be, there would hold be an atmosphere in the National Film and Sound Archive, even in Sydney, where the public were welcomed in and could come in and feel part of it and enjoy part of watching, you know, the past and enjoy that element of Australia, the vision of Australia, the visual side of Australia, and all that's all gone. Yeah. You know, I went to Canberra, you know, I was doing the research for a blaze and I'd be in Canberra a lot and I'd go, I went to every different archive and it was so depressing. Yeah. There was no public face anymore. No. It was like, it was just these empty kind of, you know, uninspiring kind of atmosphere. And I cannot understand a society where that happens. And, you know, down the road, you go down the road and then there's a no, no discredit to the, to, the, to the people who served in the wars, but you go up at this um, big boulevard and there's these 
incredibly expensive statues to soldiers and war. And you're going, you know, half a billion dollars has been spent on one, you know, the, the National yes. War Memorial yes. to make a Disneyland yeah. of, yes, right. of, of yeah. the war, which is disgusting. Yeah. And, and the archives who, like the national, you know, the fact that we had the National Archives had to go crowdfunding to actually embarrass the government to get a bit more money to do a preservation. And I understand it that, you know, the archives, like National Film and Sound Archive, as the other archives, have to make this terrible decision between preservation and getting access to the public. And, of course, they need to preserve the material as well. But it, it needs to get out to the public, and the, it, the public need to be welcome into this place and say, this is our path. Let, you know, learn about it. But that, that's the situation today, you know, and, and that's, you know, that again, the nine years of that previous government has, has been responsible for a terrible shutdown of our access to the past. That it used to... Yeah. I think I think the last decade has been disastrous. Yeah, um, where funding and and ad, but not, and not just funding, but staffing has gone backwards. So a lot of corporate memory has just walked out the door, and That's and right. a lot of yeah. that spirit has walked out the door. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, and when you think how hard it was to get the NFSA established in the first place, mm -hmm. which was a long, long, long battle, and battle carried out here, long after such battles have been fought in other countries decades earlier. It took us a long time to take it seriously, uh, and now we don't fund it properly. And yes, we, you know, we've, um, but they can find money to spend on the war memorial. For you know, it's now um, five hundred fifty million and counting. They're asking for more money, um, and uh, just just a sliver of that would do something for the other institutions. Mm -hmm. It's it's quite bizarre. I, I remember Ray when. Um... Well, I did lousy little sixpence. I'd go to the basement of the National li National uh, Library, was it? Mm. And and there was a uh, there was an old steam back, and you'd get the reels brought out, you know. And 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 people were even were saying there how they couldn't preserve material, and material would go to the dump. They couldn't save uh, television footage; it'd actually be sent to the dump because there was no place to store it, you know. So that battles that people would were fighting then to get the National Film and Sound Archive established and yep. the idea of preservation. Um, it, it's, it, and, and we're in the state now where it's just, you know, not been accessed to people. No. It's, it's, just, it's really anyway, disturbing. Nearby hangs a very long tail, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and we could spend another hour or so discussing this, but uh, I, we might uh, end it there. Uh, thank you to Daryl, who had to leave. Alec and Sue, pleasure uh, discussing Hunt Angels with you both. It's uh, such an incredible film, and certainly I recommend everyone uh, goes to see it if they haven't already seen it. Thank, thanks so much, Peter. Thank Even you, Peter. Available at, on our, our Film Art Media website, along with all of our other documentary films. And I've just put the link up for A Blaze, which is um, currently available on ABC I, I View. I, I view. would yeah, really encourage yeah. you to see it because it's an extraordinary film and a real credit to you, Alec, you know, for con continuing to uh, fight to tell these important stories. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was certainly... Uh, Another tough one, so, um, but you know, in the end, um, somehow, you know, we were a bit like little terrier dogs. You know, we bite and bite the bone, and we won't let it go when yeah. somebody tries to take it from us. Um, but thank you very much, Peter and Gwenda, for uh, organising today, and and Bruce, and thank you everyone for attending. It's lovely to see you and talk today, and very much appreciated. And hopefully we can, you know, get some money flowing in our direction. Mm. Mm. Thank yep. you, Peter and Glenda. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Thank very you. much, everyone. Uh -huh. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Good session. Thanks.